So, um, so basically, what I'm going to do in this um, in this workshop is rather than rather than it being just about um, Google Analytics alone, what I've decided to do is do it based on analytics altogether. Because um, if you go kind of go down the route of um, we need because the whole point of analytics is to get quantitative analysis is to get insight based on what your customers are doing, and that can come from a lot of places. You don't want to just restrict yourself to um, Google Analytics. Basically, you want to be able to do. Um, you want to be able to use any analytics tools, and as as long as you understand the best practices that go on behind that, then um, as long as you can understand how to use the tool in itself and apply those best practices, then you can you can basically get done whatever it is that you need to get done. Then you're not restricted by the anal analytics tool that you use, and as your needs change, and as things change, and as the tools get better and things, because they're always they're always getting better. Um, you know, you can take advantage of that if you're if you're familiar with the best practices. So. Um, so the first thing is, um, why should you use an analytics? Um, and it basically comes down to understanding qualitative and quantitative analysis, right? So your um, qualitative analysis is basically the why. Why do people do certain things? Or why are they behaving a particular way on our website? Why are they, why are they using this app? Why are they not using this app? Um, those kind of things, basically. The quantitative analysis is the how and the what. So how are people actually behaving? How long are they spending on our website? Um, how often are they coming back to the website? Excuse me. <clears throat> um, what are they actually doing when they come to the website? Are they are they staying on the front page? Are they um, uh, are they uh, you know reading the blog post? What is it that they are actually doing? And the way in terms of actual digital marketing or in terms of getting insight so that you can actually take that forward, what you have to do is you have to combine the qualitative analysis with the quantitative analysis. So what tends to happen in a lot of digital marketing sectors is they either focus too much on the quantitative and then forget about the qualitative. Like especially with people that have engineering backgrounds, backgrounds they focus a lot on the, you know, people who develop apps and things, they focus a lot on the quantitative, they look at the analytics, but then they don't look at the qualitative. Or if you people who come from traditional marketing backgrounds, they look at the kind of qualitative aspect of things and they kind of forget about the quantitative aspect. And the biggest advantage that you've got in digital marketing now is that you can actually combine the two together, get really deep insights about your audience, you really get into their head as to why they're doing certain things, and then you can do something with that and actually improve your product or improve, improve your um, marketing efforts and, and take that somewhere. So it's about combining those two together. So what analytics does for you really just gives you the quantitative analysis. It does give you a little bit of the qualitative but not enough. It's really just about doing the quantitative analysis. So the whole of this workshop is just about um, quantitative analysis and then how to use the analytics to actually perform that and then how you can actually use that. So are you okay with that so far? Yeah. Everybody all right? Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. So we have obviously already mentioned quantitative analysis is the what and the how. Um, so where can you actually use analytics? Um, analytics uh, at the moment is you can use websites, mobile apps, email, social media, sales and CRM. But um, now that the companies have um, uh, started to understand what analytics can be used for, you can actually use analytics for almost anything and everything. So it's just a matter of time before, um, before you're going to be able to start using analytics for the, for the lit list of things. Um, the new Tesla car that's just come out, the Tesla, which I mentioned in a blog post recently, that's just come out, they have analytics in the car. So you can actually track how far you've driven and all these kind of things. And manufacturers have been putting analytics in, into the computer management systems into their cars for a while. But Tesla have taken things up a notch. So, um, and you can get analytics on your phone. You know, Apple will be tracking how you actually use your phone. You can get analytics for, um, uh, you know, obviously already websites and Facebook. But every new app that's coming out or every new device that's coming out that's an electronic or a digital device, chances are it's going to have analytics in there which is why it's better to understand the best practice of analytics than to be focusing on, okay, well, how do I actually use Google Analytics or how do I actually use Mixpanel or how, how do I actually use this? So at the moment, um, we've got analytics for websites, mobile apps, email, um, social media, um, sales software, CRM software. But as I say, there's more analytics coming out. And as soon as you understand the best practice, you'll know, okay, well, this is how I want to take advantage of this. Okay. Okay, so I'll just quickly mention, obviously, some of my personal favorites. Um, Localytics, which I really, really like. Um, the pricing is really good. Um, and Localytics is really good for real-time information. So you can see in real time, somebody who's come to your website and, and um, uh, sorry, you can see in real time the summaries of how people are behaving on your website. 
So you can see like what activity took place 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago, an hour ago. And you can ask um, questions to localytics. So you can do what's known as retroactive analysis. So you can say, um, okay, well, we had four people that came uh, four weeks ago. Uh, but we, um, so for example, this uh, mobile app that I've been developing at the moment, one of the questions that we had was, are most of the people choosing to sign up with Facebook or most of them choosing to sign up uh, using their email? But it, this was a retroactive question that we had. We, we hadn't thought about that question at the time. So in Localytics, I can actually create um, a, a dashboard for that or I can create a particular funnel for that and I can get the answer to that question. So Localytics is really, really good for that. I really enjoyed um, working with it. And, I, and I'll show you some actual examples of that when we get to it anyway. Um, Track.io, this is really good for um, getting individual an analysis. So you can see like individually um, how somebody's be, been behaving on your website. So if you had something that would actually allow you to um, uh, uh, attract people by their username or by their Facebook account, you can see exactly how they've been behaving. So on our, on our mobile app, for example, I can see John Smith went in and um, um, first he created a new story, then he wrote a line, then he wrote another line, then he clicked a new story and then he left. I can see individually exactly what's happening. Um, so Track.io is really good for that. Um, you've got MailChimp, which is really good for um, email analytics. How many people actually opened up your email? How many people clicked a link? Um, how many people unsubscribed? How many new subscribers you got? This kind of stuff. So I really like MailChimp for that. Google Analytics is really good for summaries. So it's really good for like um, demographical information. Well, how many people are actual mobile users? How many people are coming from England? How many people are coming from America? Um, uh, what's the average amount of time people are spending on our on our website? Those kind of things. Um, and then you've got Optimizely, which I'll, I'll come back to later. But Optimizely is really good for like um, A/B testing and stuff. But I'll come back to that in a bit. Everybody okay so far? Yeah. You're not getting bored or anything? Or? No. Okay, good. So uh, we'll keep going. Okay, so there is a, um, a promotion code as well um, for Track.io because Track.io is actually on beta at the moment which means you can only get in if you have a promotional code. So there is a, a code attached uh, in the slide notes to this particular presentation. So if you use that code, you can actually get in and get um, early access, early beta access to track. And it's a really, really nice product. So um, you can get access to that. Um, okay, so obviously let's get uh, a little bit more into actually how do you actually use um, analytics. So the first thing is um, integration. The only way you can actually collect, collect um, quantitative analysis data is, is if the analytics are integrated. So now with um, Google Analytics, for example, it's really easy because you, they give you a little bit of code, give you a little bit of HTML code that you put in on your website, you put on every single page, or um, uh, yeah, effectively every single page, and then Google will be, basically start tracking that, those analytics um, for you. But it's not the same for every analytics software. Things. There, there is an overall set of principles, but things change slightly. Um, so um, I'll explain that obviously a little bit more. So there is something called um, event tracking. So this is what some of the other analytics tools do a little bit better than, than what Google does. So on your website, for example, um, you'll have, like you, on your website, you'll have like, a, uh, you might have like a, a form, you'll have a button to say, click this to call us or click this to, um, to, send, uh, to book an appointment with us. You'll have like a call to action. Or in our mobile app, for example, we've got like a button that says sign up and then we've got another button that says click this button to write a new story and all this kind of thing. So at every single point that somebody interacts with your website or with your app, um, you can actually log an event for that. So it's a little bit of code that your developer will actually put in. So you can say to your developer, can you track this event for me? So you can say to your developer, well, every time somebody fills in a form on my website, can you please um, uh, log an event for that for me? And so they'll put a little bit of code in that will do some event tracking. And then uh, the analytics software like Track.io and um, Localytics, they will actually be able to track that event. So then you can see, well, we had, uh, um, we had 100 people that came to the website and 20 people actually filled the form in because you've, you've captured that event. And then you can do more things with that. That makes sense? Yeah. If they were filling a form in though, wouldn't you have that information anyway? Yeah, so the question is, if they were filling the form in, wouldn't you have that information anyway? Yes, you would. So you would have the, you'd have whoever your provider is of filling the form in. Yeah, you've got that information. But what if you wanted to get in, what if you wanted more detailed information? Like how many people filled, started filling the form in and then gave up? 
So that would be really useful information because yeah. is it the form that's stopping them from actually approaching us or is it the product? Yeah. Okay, well how many people filled the form in, pressed the button but nothing actually happened? Okay, so there's that information. How many people came to the website, read the blog post and then filled the form in, but how many people came to the website, looked at the front page and then filled the form in? So is it the, is it the, the, the reading of the blog post that's encouraging them more to, read, to, to fill the form in or is it the front page of the website? So that, those kind of questions can't really be answered by just having analytics on the form itself. So it's just saying, okay, well, we know 20 people filled the form in that came from the website. What you really want is much more detailed behavior um, analysis. So, so that can't really be done um, just with that alone. But if you have event tracking, you can get some very, very detailed information. So you can get some very detailed insight. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. You all right, so far? Yeah, good. <laughs> okay. So um, the other thing with um, analytics is obviously um, when you're collecting the data, you do obviously want statistical confidence. You do, what you don't want is, okay, well, we had one person came to the website, they didn't fill the form in, so the website's failed. Or we had one person who used our app, they didn't, they didn't write a new story, or they didn't do this, or they didn't do that, we didn't get a conversion. Um, and so therefore, um, we failed, or, or they did do it, and therefore this is a massive success. So you, obviously you need a certain amount of statistical confidence. The more data that you have, obviously the more statistical confidence that you've got. But there are obviously certain best practices that you can use. Generally what they say is that for any particular event, if you capture 100 um, events, it's a general best practice, then that's quite indicative of how things are going along. So if you were to say, um, so rather than saying, okay, well, we'll bring 100 people to our website and let's see what happens, it's a good, it's a good starting indication. But if you could say, okay, well, 100 people filled the form in, and, then, and so that m might relate to, okay, well, we had 1,000 people that, that came to a website, then you can say, okay, well, this, this is the current conversion rate that we've actually got. Once you've got 100 events, you now know, okay, well, hey, we can confidently say that this is roughly the conversion rate that we have at the moment. Hey, so it's at does that make sense? It's at 100 events. So is it like a percentage, basically? Would it, could it not work for a lower amount? It can work for a lower amount, but it just means that, like, you can say, okay, well, we had 100 people come to our website and only five people clicked the form, right? So you can say, well, you've got some, you have got some statistical confidence there to say, okay, well, at the moment, our conversion rate is only 5%. But if you were to get that number, but if you want to, if you want to give that um, more confidence, as in say, are we absolutely confident that our conversion rate is only 5% that you can say, okay, well, let's see, if, let's see if we can get more traffic in to get 100 people to fill the form in. And so our theory is, well, 100 people filling the form in, if we're at a 5% conversion rate, then that means, what is that, is, um, is uh, 500, is, no, it's not 500, is it? 1,000 people. It's worth, oh, no, so it's 2,000, sorry. If you brought in 2,000 people and 100 people fill it in, you've still got a 5% conversion rate, so you can check that. You could, you can just give yourself more confidence yeah. with that, basically. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Just give me a second, because I don't know who this is, but I just want to make sure this isn't an urgent call. Okay. So let's go back. So yeah, it's just the, the more. Basically, what I'm saying is, the more data that you have and the more events that you capture, the more statistical confidence that you're going to get. But if you can capture like a minimum of 100 people or a minimum of 100 events, um, and I'll show I'll show you that in the actual analytics when we get in. Um, it just means that you can be more confident to say, yeah, this, this data is, is actually pretty sound. You just want that data to be sound, basically. Yeah? Okay, so, so obviously... Sorry, it's just the way you presented the data. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right, so the next thing, obviously, is... Um, so so you, you've got yourself to the point where you've, um, uh, you've, in, you've implemented Google Analytics You've um, you've done your event tracking. Now you're ready to you, you're ready to actually be collecting that data. So the next thing that you now want is actual. Obviously, you want insight now, right? So so there's a certain approach to actually getting insight. You, what you don't want to be doing is um, just collecting the data and then having a look at the data and saying, well, uh, what do I do with this data? So if if you take a particular approach to that, then you can get better insight. So there's ways that you you can actually do that. So it starts with asking the right questions, right, uh, of the data, and, and that comes from basically having a purpose. So what do you actually, what is it that you actually want to learn about your audience? What insight do you actually want to gain, right? So you, you will, you know, you can say, well, um, I just want to know, well, how many, um, you know, how well is our website performing in terms of uh, getting people to come to 
to, uh, you know, getting people to buy this product, for example, that might be a simple question. That your purpose is, I just want to sell more of this product. But not every website is an e-commerce website. Not every website sells a product. Maybe you just want uh, to establish, maybe your website is just there to, to help you establish credibility or to increase your brand value. So there's a purpose attached to that, but you can, you can measure it on, on uh, um, to a certain extent, you can measure that. You can measure certain behaviors, right? So you can, um, uh, obviously you can ask a question to that. Or it might be a case of like, if you've got a mobile app, for example, you say, well, we just want, like for our, we've got a mobile app where people write stories. For, for us, you know, the question is, um, can we actually get them to write stories? So you can actually, you know, that's the purpose we want them to write stories. So if you have the right purpose, then you can make sense of the data. If you're asking the right questions, if you're not asking the right questions, you can't make any sense of the data. It's just there and it just overwhelms you. Yeah. Um, it just confuses you because you don't know what to do with it. So it's important to be asking the right questions first and having the right purpose first and then taking that forward from there. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. So the way that you can that, the way that you can then actually start measuring that is to, to is to actually come up with a meaningful action. Is so so your meaningful action basically relates to your activation or your conversion or your retention. So your activation is, for example, if you're um, we've got this mobile app for example. For us, a meaningful action is that if somebody if somebody downloads the app, opens up the app and actually uh, writes their first uh, you know goes through the because we've got a tutorial in there. So they go through the tutorial and understand how to play the game, and then if they write their first story, for us we consider that to be a meaningful action. The, 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 our purpose is we want them to write stories. So if they write their first story, they are, they, they've, they've performed a meaningful action and we consider that to be user activation. So you, you understand that to be activation. So that's, the, that's the, uh, the right question that we're then asking at that point. But for somebody else who's selling the product, their meaningful action might be, uh, they want, you want them to go in and have a look at the product um, and start reading about the product. And you might consider that just that in, in itself, in the beginning, you might just consider that to be the meaningful action. But you, might, but you might say, okay, well, we don't just want activation, we actually want them to convert. So you might say, okay, well, um, what the event that we're going to actually log is where they actually come in and they click the buy now button, they put their credit card details in, and they actually complete the checkout. So that might be your, your meaningful action. And so once you've decided what that is, you can then set that up in your analytics. You can actually go in your analytics and you can say, right, well, and obviously I'm gonna show you actually how to do that. We can actually go into your analytics and you can say, this is what my meaningful action is and this is what I want to measure in terms of conversion. And so you've already got your data, um, you've already, already got your analytics code put in, you've already got your events being tracked, you already know the question that you're asking, questions that you're asking, you've already decided what your meaningful action is, and now you then start collecting the data and then you can say, right, are we, is this meaningful action actually taking place or, or how well is this meaningful action taking place? Which is, what, how good is our actual conversion rate now or how good is our actual activation rate now? So you can actually start measuring more and then you can start doing something with that. Yeah? Okay, so then obviously you can, um, you can define um, key metrics. Now, one of the one of the uh, problems that you have um, uh, again, this is this 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 is a problem that can be uh, can take place in, in a lot of digital marketing places. Is that um, you get a lot of uh, general numbers. You say, well, your activation rate should be this much, or your conversion rate should be this much, or your um, your retention rate should be this much, or, or whatever. Or you should have this this much figure coming. Obviously, there are certain um, numbers that, are, that are apply to, you know to certain best practices. If if you've got ten percent of your audience. Which is, um, which, is, which is coming to your website on mobile, then you should know that from that, okay, that you know, we've got 10% of our audience are coming from mobile. Um, and, and we have general numbers for that, you know, 30% of users are now mobile users when they come to your website and stuff. And if, that, if you know that, if that's a key metric that you've already put, you can, that's a key metric, sorry, that you can take as a best, best practice, that's fine. But if you've got a new product or if you've got a product that, um, it doesn't have a number from a best practice, then you need to come up with the metrics yourself. You need to know for yourself, okay, well, what do we consider to be um, a, a decent metric for activation? Like for us, for example, um, we said to ourselves that if 40% of our users actually write their first story, then that's great. That's a metric that we've defined for ourselves. If we say, if you say that if you're selling, for example, if you're selling like Rolex watches, and you're getting 100 people coming to your website and you're expecting to sell 40 watches every single day and you're saying to yourself, well, our key metric is we want to sell 40 watches a day, 40% conversion rate. 
probably setting yourself up for disappointment because the, the, the Rolex or the Timex or whatever these watches are, selling at a thousand, a thousand pounds at a time or three thousand pounds at a time, you, it's probably, you know, it's probably a little bit ambitious to expect for every hundred people that you're going to bring in to be able to ship 40 watches at a time. So you need, and but the thing is, you, you probably already have those metrics within your business. If you've got a shop front and you know that for every 10 people that come into my shop, I actually do sell one watch, then okay, you already know that I have a 10% conversion rate. Therefore, I want to aim to get a 10% conversion rate on my website as well. And you can define that for yourself. But you have to come up with the metrics yourself and those metrics might, cha might change over time, but they have to come from your business. And so one of the mistakes that actually happens is that you go into the analytics, you, you, get, uh, you get numbers from these best practices, you go, oh, well, my website's not behaving that way or my app, app isn't behaving that way and you set yourself up for disappointment. But if you know what your own objectives are, you're not really set up for um, uh, disappointment. You can set yourself up, okay, well, we're not reaching this number right now. What can we do to actually reach that number? Or we are reaching the number, great, let's focus on something else. Yeah? Okay. So all these, obviously, most of these things take place before you actually go in and actually start looking at the analytics. But these are the things they need to do to actually get the insight. So then um, the question, obviously, that you asked me in terms of before we actually set this presentation was, what do you do to actually um, inform your team and let your team know? The main thing to let your team know is, say, is to say, okay, well, these are the things that we've defined in terms of activation, or these are the things that we've defined in terms of conversion or retention, and this is the actual metric for it. So we've defined that for every, um, we've defined that our uh, um, uh, meaningful action is that people come to our website and that they fill that form in, that that's what we're going to consider a meaningful action. And that's a conversation that you can have with your team and you can come up with a, uh, with a meaningful action with them. Or, or, it's a, or you might even have that conversation with your, with your target audience. You might talk to them and you might get some insight and you might come up with something and say, well, this is what we've decided um, is that we actually, what we actually want to do. Um, and then you can say to your team, we've come up with a, a, a conversion rate of say 40%. Um, and you can let them know, and then when they actually, um, because you can create multi-user accounts in your analytics, and they can go in and say, right, well, we all agreed on a 40% conversion rate, yes, that, that in the analytics, that is exactly what's happening right now. Um, and, and that's all you really need to do, really, um, and, and just kind of sit down and have a conversation with them and sit decide what is it that we're actually going to do. But most of those things should be done up front, yeah. before you actually start looking at your data. Okay, the other thing is, this is a, a big term in Silicon Valley and in startup circles. So every, everybody kind of that's in digital marketing and in startup circles already knows this. But this is just for your uh, benefit, is always stay away from vanity metrics. And this is a massive curse in analytics at the moment. It's, it's a big obsession for a lot of people. And, and this is why I always say, do, do your, understand what your meaningful actions are and understand what your objectives and your key metrics are before you start looking at the data. Otherwise, you're gonna get stuck with this analytics curse and you're gonna get obsessed with it. You're gonna get stuck with these um, vanity metrics. And vanity metrics are basically metrics that don't help your business in any way, but just appeal to your vanity and appeal to your kind of sense of self-worth and self-esteem. You get a lot of people that are saying, well, I get a thousand people that are coming to my website every single day. I've got 2,000 people that come into my website. I got 100 likes on my Facebook. I got, um, I got 145 people that downloaded my app. I got this happening. You're right. All these things, if they, don't, if they don't mean anything to your actual business, they don't line with your business objective or line with your key metrics, then that metric for your business is a vanity metric. It's completely useful for you, useless for you. And this is where kind of Google Analytics kind of falls down because it can kind of affect this curse quite badly. Because you go into Google Analytics and say, well, I've got people coming from Japan and I've got people coming from Singapore and I had a thousand people come to my website. But the reality might be that you had a thousand people to come to your website and none of them actually performed a meaningful action. Therefore, you, you're being impressed by a metric that doesn't actually work for you. It might be, that metric might still be useful for you because you go, well, okay, something's wrong here. It means to do something with this. But you know the, the point is don't get don't get um, blown away by uh, by vanity metrics. So understand the metrics that actually matter to you, and actually drill down into them. This is why um, apps like Localytics and um, Track.io I, I find really useful because they don't let you get carried away with vanity, metric, vanity metrics right from the outset. They make sure that you've asked the right questions up front, so you can only set those up. Whereas Google, it just gives you everything, and then you can get carried away with that. Um, and that's the key thing is to is to, to not get blown away with it. Okay, so the next thing is um, 
uh, obviously activation and conversion. So let me just, I'm just going to pause this a second. Okay, so the way that you, um, there's this thing in um, analytics called funnels, and that's how you can actually measure um, uh, activation, conversion, and retention. I don't know if you can see that graphic behind there quite uh, clearly enough, but you can see um, you have basically this thing called um, uh, funnels in analytics software, and you can, once you've decided that, okay, well, this is what the activation, the conversion rate was that we wanted. It, the analytics software will actually then start giving you summaries of that. So you, you set up what's known as, um, in quotation marks, a, a, a funnel. And so you can say, right, well, if uh, we, our metric is we want, we want a minimum conversion rate of 10%, for example. So you go into the analytics software, you set the funnel up, you give it a name. So you could say, okay, well, this is, uh, this is our activation funnel, this is our conversion funnel, or this is a funnel for, for it. It doesn't really matter. I mean, you, you decide that. And then um, as the data starts coming in, the analytics software will actually, because rather than you actually getting in an Excel spreadsheet and working all this out, we had a thousand people come in and then this happened and this happened, and you put all this spreadsheet and work all this out. This is where the analytics software is really helpful, because once you set that funnel up within the analytics software, it will actually work that out for you and it will say, okay, well you did, um, so you know for yourself, okay, well our analytics, um, our uh, conversion rate was supposed to be 40%. And then you go in and have a look at that funnel, you say, okay, well, the conversion rate at the moment is, is 5%. Right, it's not doing as well as we wanted it to, let's do something with that. And so the funnels will actually show you how well you're actually performing in terms of what, it, what, what the questions were that you were actually asking. And so Track.io, Localytics, Google Analytics is okay for this as well, but I found Localytics and, um, and Track.io and these kind of softwares a lot better for this. So they're really good for funnel ana analysis. And the other thing that funnels actually do is that if you've got your meaningful action, whereas, okay, well, what our meaningful action is that we actually want them to come to the website, then we want them to um, read the blog post, then we actually want them to um, fill the form in, um, and then we actually want them to press the button and actually uh, send the form off to us. These might actually be four steps within your funnel, right? Where you, set, you can actually set the, you, you do the event tracking for every step of that actual funnel, and then you can actually measure Within that funnel, you can actually see what's going on. You can see, okay, well, we had a thousand people that actually came to the website, then 800 of them read the blog post, then 600 of them uh, filled the form in, and then 450 of them actually pressed the button. And you can see where in that funnel things actually dropped off. And you can see, okay, well, they started filling the form in. Well, we had a thousand people, 400 of them actually filled the form in, but they never pressed the button, or we never actually received the form. And so you can see where things are actually breaking within your funnel and you can then identify the pain point and say, right, well, obviously something's wrong with the form. Something's going wrong with the form. Either the form's too long or it's not working on their mobile or it's broken or whatever. And then you can go back and actually have a look at that funnel and say, right, this is where things are going wrong. Now you know where you need to pay your more attention. So while the rest of the world is saying, okay, well, things are not working, we need to rebrand our website. Things are not working, we need to hire a better web designer, or things are not working, we, we need a better product, or whatever. The reality is the data is already showing you things are not working because your form's broken, or this is broken, or, or whatever. And, and so you can get right into the, to the heart of And the analytics will, will pinpoint exactly where things are going wrong. Okay. So that's how you actually find out, well, this is actually what's failing for us. That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's really, really good if you've got an app, but it's all, it's still really good even for websites as well, because websites, you, you'll normally find that you'll have two or three, four or five different actions that will actually take place. You'll find people come to your website. They won't just, if you, if you actually monitor yourself when you go to a website, they won't, you, you don't just have a look at our website and click the buy button. You know, if you go to Amazon, you'll have a look around, you'll have look, you'll have a look at four or five different products. Let's say you're buying, um, you're buying like a, I don't know, you know, you're buying like a, um, uh, a new phone, for example. You're going to have a look at a few phones. You're going to have, you're going to read a few reviews. You're going to um, have a look at some, um, some of the specifications. You might come back two days later, and then you might buy, right? But all, that, all those analytics are being tracked, and then you can see that behavior, and you can see, okay, well, they came back, but they didn't buy. Well, what can we actually change to actually encourage them to buy? What, what are the things that we can actually do? Um, and so if you've got a funnel that's having, having a look at that behavior, you can see, all right, well, they came back after three days or they, um, they came in and um, they didn't buy, they disappeared, what's going wrong? Or maybe they were looking for a review, but they couldn't find one. So let's, let's bring review into there. Let's show them the reviews and actually show them 
um, let's get them more interested in the product. Or like, you know, so you can actually keep chopping and changing and keep doing that. This is why it's not worth spending, you know, six or seven thousand pounds on a brand new website right at the, uh, right from the outset because you haven't. There's not enough data for you to know exactly how the the audience is behaving. But if you can learn how the audience is behaving and then start kind of tweaking the website and making changes and all these kind of things, then you you're not going to spend a whole lot of money on something where you realize, okay, well this wasn't actually going to work for us, and that money hasn't then been lost. Mm-hmm. Because you can actually, you know, tweak that and, and, and work that in those ways. So that's funnels, and, I, and I obviously I'm, I am going to show you that in the in the demo section. As I said, Google Analytics is really good for um, summaries. Like, where's the bulk of my traffic coming from? Um, you know, the bulk of um, the bulk of uh, uh, like, you know, um, how long are people in general spending on my website? Um, are most, most of my audiences, mobile audiences, and all, all these kind of things. So Google Analytics generally are found to be really good for summaries. If you kind of want detailed information, it can, it can do it. And there is some information that you can really only get from Google Analytics and you're not going to get from anywhere else. But generally speaking, um, uh, it's bet- I found like Localytics and Trackio and these kind of um, analytics tools, they do a much better job of that um, if, you, you know, if you've got the right questions. Um, and, and so Google is just really good to kind of get um, summary information. Um, next one is uh, user flow. I've kind of already alluded to this uh, quite a bit already. So you can see a, you can see the picture there behind the user flow. You, so you can actually see that if you've got all these. So on the right hand side, I don't know if you can see those. It says created an activity at the bottom. This is welcome to Trackio, viewed homepage, signed in, viewed pricing page, added credit card details, purchased something. You can see the whole flow of what, how somebody is actually behaving. So, oh so she's coming in. She's came. She's come in at like two p.m. four days before. And then she's come back at quarter to eleven today. Then she's viewed the homepage. So you can see that the average person takes four days before they make a purchase. You can see get all this you know analysis information. And is this just being tracked? So could we all be? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is uh, this is that. Uh, so the question is: Is this being tracked? Yes, absolutely. Amazon is doing this. Facebook is doing this. Google is Google is doing this with your emails. Everybody is doing this. Everybody knows exactly how you're behaving. iPhone is doing this. I, your iPhone knows exactly where you're going. If, uh, your iPhone knows you're at Cottrell House right now. It's tracking that data, and so the, so they can see what you're. Be- so they track the behavior of how you're actually behaving, and then they can f- work out. Because we're all, as humans, we're quite predictably irrational. So they can work out, well, okay, this is, this is how we can incite them more. This is how we can improve this and all this kind of stuff. So yeah, this is all happening. And with Facebook, uh, and this is where Trackio is really good, is with Facebook is that if, you, if you've got an app and somebody logs in with Facebook, then you get all their demographic data. So you see what they look like, you'll get their gender, and you can get all this extra demographic information. Yeah, this is where it all comes from. It's, I'm getting really surprised faces at the moment. <laughs> It's all this data, so like you've got all these individual agencies collecting data, but is there any one like big, a one main agency that's collecting all so, this data? So is there one main agency that's collecting all this data? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, potentially NSA is collecting all this data. So I've, I've heard reports who say the NSA is going to Facebook and is going to Google and is going to Apple and saying, give us all your data. So, so And, you know, the FBI and what have you. So uh, possibly the, they're all collecting this data. I, I don't really know, but the chances are yes. But individually, Google has a lot of data on us. You know, Facebook has a lot of data on us. Why Facebook goes through all these um, changes in terms of um, in terms of their newsfeed and like you know, Facebook's been through like what five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different um, design refreshes is because they've seen how people are behaving using their product and they find okay, well, this isn't quite working or this is working. You know, they've put adverts in front of people and they haven't really worked. And they're, okay, well, how? how they've, they've, the analytics has proved to them okay, this isn't working. Because you have this thing in Facebook at the moment is, you know, we now have ad fatigue. You'll notice an advert that comes in the, in, in the news feed, yeah, right? A suggested. A suggested. But you won't notice the advert that's on the right-hand side because we've ex- we experience fatigue now. So, you know, <clears throat> but the analytics has told them that, okay, that um, we've got a million users that are using Facebook. Nobody's clicking the ads or only 0.003% of people are clicking the ads. The analytics is telling them that. And so they, they, they can then come back and say, okay, well, what else can we actually do with this? Um, let's try this or let's try this. So they'll put the news feed, they'll put the advert in the news feed, now find that, okay, 3% of people are actually clicking on the news feed. So their conversion rate, or their, yeah, the conversion rate's gone up from 0.03% to 3%. And that's like a, what is that, 100% or a 1,000% increase in conversion? So that's like, wow, that's a really big improvement. 
So all these little iterations and all these little improvements, as you add them up, they lead to a big tipping point and they actually lead to something really big. And the way to do that is to, to get the quantitative insight from the analytic. That's how to actually, uh, actually um, do that. Yeah? And that's what analytics is really good for. <coughs> Massively unsettling, yeah. Okay, so um, this is what uh, Google Analytics, what Google Analytics will do for you is things like tell you um, how long somebody spent on a page. Um, they'll tell you bounce rate. So your bounce rate is um, literally, it's like if somebody comes, if you get 100 people come to, to a page and then they disappear after about half a minute and they don't go anywhere else, that's known as a bounce. So it'll tell you your bounce rate so you can see, okay, well, this page, if this page has got a really high bounce rate, it's just not doing very well. So bounce rates are really useful for that. And there's lots of other uh, terms like engagement and all this kind of stuff. But if you've got the right questions, you, it's really easy to just quickly Google and say, I want to know the answer to, like, how do I figure out how long people have spent on my website? And you'll find the answer to that. There's lots of articles and everything out there. But what you won't find the answers to is what other questions I should be asking and these kind of things. So, um, and that comes from, from your, you know, your business metrics. Things like your page speed, or how long is my website taking to load for people? Because those kind of things affect SEO now, um, they affect your conversion rate. If your website takes eight, nine, 10, 12 seconds to load, because, you know. What's SEO? Sorry, search engine optimization. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, if you get, you know, if you get 10 people come to your website, your, your website might take half a second to load, which is great. But if you're getting two or 3,000 people coming to it and it starts taking, you know, um, maybe like uh, five, six, seven seconds, that might be a really poor experience for people and they might just give up. But Google Analytics will show you, okay, well, this is what your page speed was. And you think, okay, right, we've got a really poor conversion rate. Maybe it's the page speed. Maybe we need to fix that. Or, you know, before, I mean, it's a best practice now. Your page speed should be below 1.2 seconds now. So you can check that before you even start. Just, because what you don't want to do is spend a thousand pounds on Google AdWords or Facebook ads or whatever, all these kind of things. You can have the analytics in place and you can be checking these things beforehand. Um, and you, and you, know, you can see, and Google will show you, okay, well, your page speed is pretty, pretty poor right now. Um, and uh, get that fixed before you actually do some heavy marketing so that it, you're not getting affected by that. Um, you've got heat maps, which kind of show you roughly where people have been clicking on your website and stuff. Heat maps can be really useful for some things, for usability studies. Uh, for other things, they're, they're not as useful. So it really depends on, on what it is that you're doing. But heat maps will kind of show you, they will show you red areas on your page. So they'll say, well, most of the people kind of focused on this part of your website, or this, you know, the top left hand corner or the bottom right hand corner. So you, say, you think, okay, well, our call to action is in the top left at the moment, but most people are kind of clicking in the bottom right. So let's move the call to action to the bottom right and let's see if that changes things. Let's see if that affects things. That kind of stuff. So that's what you can do with that. Okay. So obviously the question on everybody's mind is, well, how do you actually use that to create growth? You're collecting data now. You're doing event tracking now. You're doing, um, you're doing funnel analysis now. You've got your business objectives. Um, you've got everything. You, you've decided what your objectives are. You've figured out what your meaningful action is. You've got everything. But how do you actually um, create that actual growth? Like, What do you actually do once you've collected that data? And um, you know, you've had a look at it, well, what do you do next? Okay, so the way to actually um, do that is, again, like I said, you need to really be doing um, qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis, and obviously analytics is just quantitative analysis, is, but, is you then form, once you've actually collected that data, is form a hypothesis. So once your data is coming in and you find that, okay, well, our business objective was that we, on our website, we wanted to be able to sell one watch a day. We wanted a conversion rate of 10% or, or whatever that was. So for every 100 people that come in, sorry, for every 10 people that come in, we wanted to sell one, one watch. So we wanted a conversion rate of 10%. Then what you can do is, once you've actually had a look at that, that funnel and you could, the analytics is showing you your conversion rate at the moment is only 5%, you can then say to yourself, okay, well, um, you, you can say, okay, well, you do, you do the qualitative analysis, so you go to talk to your audience, you figure out what those things are. You can say, okay, well, it looks like at the moment the reason why we're only getting 5% of people actually buying something is that the funnel is showing us that, um, that when, they, when they come in to actually buy the, the actual product, for example, what's actually happening at the moment is they click the buy now button, it then takes them to another website, and then they never come back. Right? So you can say, well, maybe what's actually happening is that when they're going to the other website, um, they're losing the confidence because it's not showing credit card information. 
or because they don't have a PayPal account and that's why they're not buying, or because of this, or because of that, or whatever. So you'll have all these um, theories, you have some hypotheses. So what you can do is you can say, well, you know, this is the most strongest, this is the strongest hypothesis we have at the moment. This is what we think it is. You can just test it. So you can say, right, okay, well, so they're not buying from us because they don't have a PayPal account, as an example. So, but maybe they would buy from us if they had a credit card account. So let's set, let's set up a page where they can pay us via credit card. Let's set that page up. Let's run it for a week. Let's go back to the funnel and say, okay, well, last week when we had a PayPal account, we only had a 5% conversion rate. This week, now we've letting them buy via credit card. Now we have a 10% conversion rate. Okay, that's what the problem was. That has solved it. Now let's move on to the next objective and solve that. No, it hasn't solved it. We've now got a 3% conversion rate. Okay, let's go back to PayPal. Obviously, that's not what the answer was. What, was our, some of our, what were some of our other hypotheses? What were some of our other theories? Let's go back and test that. And honestly, the best thing that you could, and this is what really um, affects people, is when you say test and experiment, they're like, what, why should I be experimenting with things? And why should I be annoying my audience? Is this is the psychological barrier that you have to get over, is that the testing is what's going to give you the answers. Because the conversion rate is going to give the sorry the analytics is going to give you hard data, and say yes this is positively working for you or no this is this this doesn't work. So you can go back and say okay well yeah the credit card form actually worked for us now the conversion rate okay maybe the conversion rate hasn't gone up to ten percent but it, from five percent but it's gone up to six percent okay well that's helped a little bit. What else could be affected them? Oh it, oh it's this oh it's this oh it's this oh it's because. Um, um, and we didn't give them enough information and product, or we didn't do this, or we didn't do this, and you can keep testing that. And you can keep running these controlled tests, right? And as you run them, is you eventually get your conversion rate up to 10%. Now, if you're selling um, a watch for a thousand pound at a time, and you've got a conversion rate of 5%, so five people out of every hundred are buying, um, buying a watch, you, uh, you know, you're making 5,000 pound a day, right? So let's say if it, you know, it's, it's on a daily basis. Now, if you make all these small little tweaks where you've now allowed them to buy by a credit card and now you've allowed them to do this and now you've, you know, all these little tweaks as you've been running the text, tests over the last month or two months or three months, what now happens is you slowly but surely iterated through these hypotheses and running these controlled tests. You've now got your conversion rate up to 10%. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what now happens is now you're not selling uh, 5,000 pounds worth of watches a day. Now you're selling 10,000 pounds of watches a day because you're selling 10 a day because you've improved your conversion rate to 10%. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so that's what it basically comes down to. Do you need to? Oh, yeah. Okay, so the question from Mark was, um, companies must be spending millions on, on doing this kind of analysis and all this kind of stuff. So. Um, the answer is, um, they were in the beginning, definitely. Um, so if you look at like uh, the big supermarkets, your Tesco's and your Walmart's and these kind of um, uh, supermarkets and, and your big companies like your American Express and what have you, in the beginning, they were spending a lot of money because this is why you had loyalty cards because they were doing quantitative analysis. So when you actually, um, when you went to the supermarket and instead of you got a club card, um, a loyalty card and you say, yeah, I have this. And then what happens is that all your transactions, when you bought the apples and the bananas and the, and the cereal, it was actually, that data was getting logged against um, your loyalty card so they could see your, what your spending habits and everything were. And originally, like in the late 80s and the early 90s, it was really expensive to do that because you had to spend money on, on um, loyalty cards. You had to spend money on big databases. You had to get database programmers in, and you know mainframes, and maybe not mainframes, but you know a lot of computing power. Because obviously, this takes up a lot of computing power and, and um, all this kind of stuff. So yeah, at that time, it was really expensive. But this whole analytics thing isn't anything new. What's now happened is it's just become more and more accessible. Because what happens is um, uh, obviously, you know, to actually do okay, obviously you have to pay a developer to develop code and all this kind of stuff for you, but in, in comparative cost, it's a lot cheaper now. And so these analytics companies are giving you, you know, Google is giving you analytics software for free, right? Um, Localytics and Track.io, you know, they're, they're very, um, they're very uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things, they're not particularly expensive to actually use. So what's happened is that that, that data has now become more accessible to, the, to, the, to their masses. Where you had your really big companies doing it before, your American Expresses and, and, and your Targets and all of these, um, and your, um, you know, your, uh, your Amazon, because Amazon's been doing this for a very, very long time. They were really innovating in this area. 
Um, they're kind of what driving this in. But, but, but your companies like your Google, your, you know, Google has kind of made this a lot more accessible to the, to the mass public. So which then means that you can get your developer that's been working on the weekend, who's been developing, developing a mobile app just on weekends, who can do this quantitative analysis, who can do this qualitative analysis and have a million dollar app by doing this and by improving the product and making the product so good, but you know, by collecting analysis, because now they have the tools in their hands, which they didn't have access to before. And that's what's now creating these, um, you know, backyard um, uh, success stories. It's, it's stuff like this, basically. So yeah, to, to, uh, does, that, does that answer yeah, your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, so the, obviously the, the way to validate your hypotheses is, is to actually, um, you know, come up with a hypothesis and then actually test it. But there are additional tools that will actually help you do that as well. So you can use what's known as A-B testing. So this is where I, I mentioned an analytics tool called Optimizely before. But, it, but it's important to understand what A-B testing is first. So A-B testing uh, is basically you have A, the, the A thing is basically like your control and B thing is a new thing that you're actually trying. And so it's called A-B testing, you, right? And there's a certain amount of mathematics that go into it. So you, you have to get your mathematics right, but you can get tools that will do all the, math, the heavy lifting of the mathematics for you. So all you need to do is, is basically just run the test and that will give you the answer. So Optimizely, which is a really good uh, piece of software. So with Optimizely, what you can do is you can say, right, uh, again, going back to this example of the credit card, for example, you can say, right, well, we wanted them, uh, we think it's PayPal that's causing the issue. We want to use, we want to get them to pay via credit card, for example. So your A becomes your, um, your PayPal uh, page and your B becomes your credit card uh, page. And then what you can do is you can get up, you can use Optimize, you can uh, put the, I mean, it's just a little bit of development work. It's not a lot, it's a really short space of time. It's like 30 minutes of work for a developer max. You get them to put the code in uh, into your website. And then what Optimizely will do is to a sample of your, you can specify all these things to Optimizely. And then for a sample of your audience, what, what Optimizely, Optimizely will do is to one sample will show them the A page, as in your PayPal page, and to another sample of your audience will show you the B page. And then it will actually work out the maths for you and say, right, your B page is performing better than your A page by this much. Yeah. And so it does all the hard work for you. And again, to do this 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago was really, really hard work. Uh, but it's not anymore. The tools are accessible to all of us now. So all you have to do is just pay for a simple, I think it's like $15, $20, $30 a month for Optimizely. Just go in. Speak, you, you do need to have, a, 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 you, don't, you don't need to have like a world-class WIS developer to set this up for you, but you do need to have at least like a junior developer, somebody that's got a little bit of JavaScript, CSS, but it's not like hours and hours of work, it's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes of work, and go to the developer and say, this is what I need you to set up for me, and they will just go in and set it up for you, and say, this is what I want to track, can you please do that for me, and that's it. And, 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 and then optimize this, tracking that for you, run it for two or three weeks, Make sure you get your statistic, statistic, ugh, statistical confidence, but Optimizely will tell you when it feels that uh, this is where Optimizely is really good. They will actually tell you when you've got enough statistical confidence as well. So you don't even have to worry about that. It will tell you when you've got it. And it will give you a, a conclusive answer. So this, this, this particular page is working then better than this page. And this is something that Google can't do as well for you. You kind of have to do your manual work. Yeah. Um, and localytics and all this can do them, but you know, like, um, but again, it comes down to having the right questions yeah. and forming the right hypotheses and basically executing in the right way. We've That's got it as an option on MailChimp at the moment for our newsletters. So you've got A-B testing on your yeah. uh, newsletters. So you moment. can try out like different, um, you know, like titles of the newsletter yeah. or content. Yeah, so you, th you can be doing the A-B testing. So with that, with your MailChimp, for example, what you could be doing as the emails have been going out, once you come up with what a meaningful action is, and you come up with what your actual objectives are, then you can actually go and speak to your audience and actually speak to them first, get some qualitative analysis from them, get the emotive side of things, understand why they behave in certain ways, and then come up with a theory and say, okay, well, let's A-B test this. So if you've got a thousand people on your mailing list, you can then, if you come up with it, okay, well, we think that this is what's gonna fix this. We think a shorter email is gonna improve our uh, activation rate. So we think if we put pictures in our email or if we actually talk, speak in this way or we write this subject line, you say, okay, well, Instead of, um, and this also comes down to the reach test and pre-screening, instead of sending the email out to a thousand people, let's send it out to a hundred people. Let's A-B test that. Let's see how it behaves. Okay, we sent the email out to a hundred people and what we found is, um, 
instead of a 7% click-through rate, we're getting a 9% click-through rate. Okay, this email's working better. Let's now send it out to the rest 900 people. And so as you keep iterating that and as you keep improving that, um, you're going to start getting a much better uh, performance improvement and then your email list is going to start working for you. Yeah? Uh, and then obviously, once you've done the A-B testing, once you've done the beta testing and the pre-screening, then you can actually roll it out to the mass audience. So you can, you can start with the sample audience as well. If you've got 1,000 people in your mailing list, just maybe run that with 100 and see how things behave and then scale it out to 1,000. You, you, you know, you'll have, you'll have heard of this concept in, um, in the movies that do pre-screening yeah. where, you know, like I Am Legend, for example, they, they, they had a small pre-screening audience, they tested it, they got their feedback, and then they said, okay, well, let's make these few changes, and then they went back, and, and the comedians, stand-up comedians do this as well. They pre-screen and, and they re refine and iterate that product, and then they go out and, and launch it to the mass audience. And that's important uh, in this particular space because what you don't want to do is if you were going to spend like a thousand pounds on email marketing for something, or you're going to spend five thousand pounds on on Google AdWords or all these kind of things, if you haven't kind of if you haven't optimized your conversion funnel, and you haven't optimized all your funnels beforehand, then you're just losing all that money because you're going to get all these people coming into your funnel, and they're not going to convert or they're not going to activate, and then all that money is being lost, you know. Um, and that's the most important thing is this is how you actually save money is by by doing things in, in small chunks and, and iterating that, improving that first. And then going on and, 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 and taking it out to the mass audience. And this is why you get a lot of people who develop apps, for example, and spend months and months developing this really big app where they could have been testing every small thing every step of the way. They could have been testing every small little feature every step of the way, and they haven't been doing that. And also they develop this really big app and they spend 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 on this really big budget. Um, and then maybe they're going to spend 5,000 pounds on doing PR or 10,000 pounds on you know, some really heavy advertising. And the people come in, use the app and disappear, and now they've run out of money because they can't actually now afford to actually make the improvements that they wanted to make. And if they had been doing that quantitative analysis right from the get-go in really small chunks, they would, have been start, they would have started to get a lot of insight, really, really useful insight, where they could have said, okay, well, the product's going off in the wrong direction, and let me make these little tweaks. So it might be something really insignificant to you. It might be a really big deal to your target audience. You start making those tweaks, and then you find, okay, you don't have to waste all this money. And once you've got that, and then you, once you know that conversion funnel, this is basically what's known as conversion optimization, uh, or if you're developing a product like an, op, uh, like an app, it's known as product to market fit. Once you know that you're really, really confident that, okay, for every 100 people, I'm getting 10 people in that, uh, in, into my funnel that will actually convert, and yes, that is profitable for me, then you've got the confidence to actually go and hire out an ad agency or an advertising company and say, yeah, I'm happy to give you 5,000 pounds. Because you, you go into your spreadsheet and you put five, you do the numbers in your spreadsheet, you, you apply the conversion rate you know, in your spreadsheet, you put a 5,000 pounds, 5% conversion rate, this is how many units I will sell, this is how much it's gonna cost me to, all this kind of stuff. And you get a number at the end that says, yeah, if you were to actually do this, this is gonna actually be profitable for you, right? And so you can then have the confidence to go and spend that money. But why, why do that right in the beginning when you don't know how well it's going to actually convert? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so that, that's the whole point is that you use that to then actually validate your hypotheses. And the key is to actually validate fast. So what I mean by that is validate as quickly as possible. So run your tests as, as often as possible. Like if you've come up with, an, with, a, with a hypothesis right now, test it tomorrow. What was the quickest way that you can actually test that? What's the quickest way that I can test that? Uh, is it the PayPal thing that's not working? Is the credit card that working? How quickly can I put up another page, like, you know, in, in just in a scrappy way as possible, and test that tomorrow? Because that insight that it's going to give you is far more important than giving somebody like two or three thousand pounds to go and develop a really fancy credit card page, because you don't know how well that's going to work. So test it very quickly, test it very cheaply, test it very easily. Like, what's the easiest way you can test something? And do as many tests as possible. Because those tests are what are going to give you the insight that then going to help you iterate to get to something that actually is going to work for you. So you want to be doing the tests on a regular... It's kind of refining of the process. Yeah, it? yeah, it's really, it's kind of refining the process and it's really tweaking the process as much as possible. And then as you iterate that, and as my good friend Albert Einstein always said, is compounding lo logic is the most uh, important force in the universe. That's what he said, so, um, and, and the, that comes from basically iterating as fast as possible, is, is compound that as quickly as you can. Yeah. Um, and that's where it comes from. Um, there is another um, quote by Thomas Monson, I think it was, that that which is measured uh, and monitored 
uh, the rate of import performance improves and that which is something, I can't remember the exact um, quote, but he basically says that when you measure and monitor uh, something, the rate of, the rate of improvement uh, also improves as well. So if you're measuring it and monitoring it, then it actually improves. Okay, so uh, that's by me, but let's, let's give you some demos. So uh, let me show you uh, Localytics. So this is Localytics, I'm gonna log in. Oh, sorry, uh, this is Localytics, right. So I'm gonna show you, um, so this is the event, for example, I'm gonna show you first. So uh, we've, on our mobile app, we've got like, I can say, I can click on, for example, press the new story, and I can see how many people uh, pressed on a new story. Uh, I think these are new occurrences and um, altogether, yeah. So like, these are people that have actually come back. So 25 people came back out of 28 and wrote a new story and three and so on. And this, this is what actually happened on Wednesday. So I can see in terms of uh, when this has actually been taking place. So you can see that you know, between Tuesday and Wednesday of last week, when we relaunched the app, we've had a lot more activity. But if you come down to like on Saturday, not much is happening. So there's a question, if we've already got an objective, which is well, we want most of our users to be participating on a Saturday and that's not actually happening, already you know that something's going wrong. But I, I can only come up with that answer if I've got the right objective in mind, right? And so you can actually code all these events in. So we've got loads of events coded in. Like one of the really important things for us is that we want them to complete a tutorial. So we've got, you know, uh, how many, because this is like, this is when we just launched it back into uh, uh, a small beta, because we just, we at the moment, we just hand it out to a small amount of people. So we can see, okay, well, we had 20, the, you know, the tutorial was completed like altogether 18 times, which is great, you know, and then after that, it's kind of just died. And that's fine. We've got some uh, metrics that are showing us what's actually happening. But this all comes down to events, is but you've got to get these events actually coded in. And then as, as you do that, it's absolutely fine. But this is just individual events. If you just want to find some individual information, but if you want summaries, is basically funnels, right? So this is the funnel. So we, we, uh, we said to ourselves that we want, so what we call user activation is where we want, as part of user activation, what we want them to do when they're actually using our story mobile writing app is we want them to download the app, we want them to start the tutorial, we want them to enter some lines, we want them to complete the tutorial, and then we want them to write a new story, okay? So we've had 54 people, now, and our objective of the conversion rate was uh, 40%, okay? So we've had 54 people that actually came in, and this is, oh, by the way, this is between January the 5th and January the 22nd. We had 54 people come in, 96% of them started the tutorial, 88% of them entered the line, only half of them completed the tutorial. So we know, okay, well, what's going on with the tutorial as to why they're not completing it? Do you see? You can see where the drop-off is. It's about there. And then you see even bigger drop-off, <coughs> you know, after that. And then, like, between entering a line and actually writing a story, the drop-off is huge. So you know, okay, well, okay, it's not the starting of necessarily, obviously this is a hypothesis that you would form, it's not necessarily the starting of the tutorial that's causing an issue. It's probably the completing of a story. Something's going wrong. Right. It might also be the way that we're collecting the data, because one of the things that we actually found was that what we then found was uh, when we were, when we first started doing this, because the app actually launched in like November time, what we found was that if somebody brings their friend in, they don't really want to complete the tutorial because their friends already showed them how to play the game. So we did, we had to give them an option to skip the tutorial. So we then had to bring something else in, which was um, tutorial skippers. So I've named this myself. So you can see, right, you know, 1%, 2% conversion rate, whatever. The thing is, I mean, this, 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 this isn't actually reflective of what's going on because we've got a lot more data and there's a lot, there's, there's different uh, ways that we're actually collecting. So we, so we kind of, we have a good idea of what's working for us and what isn't, but it just shows you some of the data. But you can see that even for the tutorial skippers, that okay, if we had 54 people come in, only one person's actually gone and completed a story. And, and one of the things that we, we, we realized that what happened is we weren't actually tracking that event properly. So that's, that data isn't actually um, uh, particularly accurate. So, you know, we had to go back and assess the data in different ways. But what we actually found was it, it's about 25% of the audience that is actually completing the story. So, so that's, that's one of the questions that we asked is that how many, you know, this is a meaningful action that we've got for conversion, what's actually going on, right? If you were to do this in a spreadsheet, it starts to get pretty involved. 
And if you were to do all this manually, it's a lot of hard work. But the analytics software just does all the hard work for you, provided you've done the event tracking and away you go. Right? Most of the work's been done for you. Now, the other thing is um, cohorts. Now, cohorts are not, I mean, this is one of the things that was in Google Analytics that people started, people started um, it wasn't cohorts, but it was like returning users and all this kind of stuff. And like, if you've got a brochureware website, where you're showing people, like you're selling sofas or something, I don't know how much you really need people to be coming back to your website every single day. It's probably not that big a deal. But if you've got an app, you want, you know, Facebook, for example, and you want people to be coming back to that app every single day. So this is where the cohort analysis comes in. And this, this, what this does is measure your retention levels. Sorry, cohort? cohort a group. So the question is, what is a cohort? Yeah, a cohort is basically a group, like individual cohorts of people, individual demographics of people. Now, for an app, for example, or for Facebook, for example, you want to be able to see, like, okay, well, after, ha you know, after a week, how many people come back? So in our app at the moment, we had 88 people that came in in the first week, and then a week later, we only had 14% of people coming back. Now, again, this comes back to, if you're spending £5,000 in advertising or $10,000 in advertising, and you've had 2,000 downloads, and then you've only had five people come back after a week. You've just wasted ten thousand pounds, right? So th this 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 analysis is showing you something's going wrong. And this is where I was saying that hundred hundred is kind of your magic number. Like we've got hundred people there that have, you know we haven't got hundred. We've obviously got eighty eight. But if you if you account it for two or three weeks, we've got more than hundred people. Our retention is absolutely awful at the moment. It's completely point, pointless for us right now to be spending ten thousand pounds in advertising. It's not going to take us anywhere. So what we really need to be, so that's telling us that the question need to, we need to be asking is why is retention failing? So we've been doing things about that. We've been going back to the audience, we've been speaking to them, and we've been asking them what is, what's wrong with the game or what's going on and they're telling us like, you know, well, it's really nice to be able to write a story but the stories are just not really funny or whatever, you know, whatever those things are and that's fine. Um, and this kind of goes back into this whole vanity thing is that if, if you get into this idea of vanity, you know, because as I say, self-esteem and narcissism are flip sides of the same coin. If you kind of being, if you have that vanity, you have that narcissism about you, then you can kind of have that self-esteem and the, lack, the fear of vulnerabilities. You're not going to go to the audience and let them tell you, well, why is this product failing or why isn't this working? And you have to have that because you can go back to them and they will say to you, well, it's failing because of this or it's failing because of that or we don't like this or whatever. And you can come up with a theory. Now, one of the theories that we have at the moment is that the reason why it's failing is because um, uh, one of the things that happens in the game at the moment is when you want to write a random story, the, the other person doesn't respond for a day or two at a time, and that's because the other person might, you might be in, um, you might be in like um, New York and the other person might be in Taiwan, so they might be asleep. So they don't respond to the story, for example. And so that's a theory that we have at the moment. So now we're coming up with a new gameplay method. We're gonna roll that out in another week we're gonna, we're gonna, obviously we've got our, you know, we've got our metrics, we've got our filters, you, we've got these um, uh, filter things here, you, you can barely see that, but you can apply the dates on that. And then we're gonna see, we're gonna try the new gameplay mode, we're gonna see in a week's time, has that improved the situation? And if the gameplay mode does even improve the situation, you know, if our retention levels improve, because the most, most important metric for us right now is retention. So if our retention actually improves, we're thinking, great, okay, we can actually now afford to bring larger audiences, and if it doesn't, we've got to go back to the drawing board again. So that's what it comes to. So you have things like flows as well. We haven't actually programmed flows in for hours. Um, we're not, we haven't actually been, this is why I was saying integration. There, is some, there are some differences with each one, and this, it takes a particular way to integrate this, but it's not, as far as I know, it's not a lot of work. It's probably like half an hour or an hour of worth of work for a developer. You've got engagement, so you can see what the engagement levels are, like how long are people spending. So we've got, you know, we've got 54 people that only spent 10 seconds. You know, somebody, three to 10, we've got 44 people that spend anywhere between three to 10 minutes, which isn't actually too bad. Um, so we can see these summaries. And there's so many uh, other questions that you can ask of this. You, know, you can go into usage, but you have to know what questions you want to ask. So I can actually go into, sorry, I can actually go into events. And I can say, you know, another question that I had was, how many people were inviting Facebook friends? And I can go in and I can find out, well, 10 people actually invited a Facebook friend. Um, and I can see further attributes about that as well. Like, 
okay, I can see names and everything, you know. The ones that, 13 people invited a Facebook friend if they were trying a new story, but only three people did it using the quick friend option. So it can get all these uh, individual pieces of information, which starts to become really useful. But again, it always comes back down to knowing what the questions are that you want to ask. But the analytics will show you pretty much whatever data you want to see if you've got the right questions. That makes sense so far? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you have got some things on, on acquisition, but it, um, localytics is more kind of acquisition in terms of if you're using campaigns where you can actually track the uh, events in terms of the acquisition. So I can't really show you much on that. Um, you've got segmentation because um, you can actually start defining segments. Like on, on our app, for example, you know, um, teenagers are probably going to behave differently to, to adults. Teenagers are probably going to have to spend more time on the game during the day whereas adults are probably going to spend more time on the game during the evenings. Um, teenagers might do, might do certain things, like they might spend more money, whereas adults might. We, we don't know. It's a theory that we have. So you can start, if, because, we, because we're doing Facebook tracking as well, we've got some demographic data, we can start um, uh, defining segments and say, well, these are the adults, these are the teenagers, or we can say these are the ladies, these are the men, or whatever. We can say these are the, the writing enthusiasts, or these are the early adopters. It, it doesn't really matter, but we can create that segment and we can segment them, and then we can start having a look at the analytics based on the individual segments as well. And so we can say, okay, well, adults don't like to spend money, so therefore, um, maybe adults do like to spend money, but they only like to spend 10 pence at a time, or 10 pounds at a time, so let's push more bigger products to them. But teenagers like to spend 10 pence at a time, though, so let's make it easy for them to buy smaller amounts of credits or whatever. So, you can then start tailoring, you know, and it starts getting really kind of interesting. And all it is is just, you know, refining that imp and, and, and improving that and as you get more and more. And you could do the same thing with your website. You know, you might find, okay, well, everybody that comes to our website that came from the blog behaved in this way, but everybody that came to our website that we advertised to on Google AdWords behaved in this way. So you can segment that. So, okay, well, these are all the people, these are all the people that came from paid advertising. These are all people that came from content marketing, for example. Segment that, and you'll notice a difference in behavior on that as well. And then you, you can get, so you can see, okay, well, people that actually read the blog, um, for example, they actually engaged, they had a higher conversion rate, and people that didn't read the blog had a low conversion rate. Well, let's stop spending money on advertising. Let's see what we can do in terms of improving the content marketing or whatever. So it can give you some really detailed insights. The other thing is, that's localytics. But the other thing is um, Track.io, this is where Track.io gets really useful, is, this is right. So because there's a lot of uh, uh, confidential data in this, um, I actually paused the video so that I'm not basically giving um, uh, uh, private information away. So I'm, showing, I'm basically showing the data of somebody that, that doesn't have any problem with showing this data. So this is the person who's actually developed this app. So um, he actually set this account up on September the 6th. Um, and obviously, you know, he was last seen using the app on, on the 18th because obviously he's not working on it at the moment. And it shows his location in London. He, has, he actually isn't based in London, he's based in Manchester. So obviously there are some issues with the data, but you can see if, for example, the localytics was really good for the funnels, which shows you like, okay, well, we've got a 40% conversion rate. We had 50 people that, um, we had 50 people that used the Facebook option or we had 20 people that um, didn't come back or whatever. Now what Track.io is really good for is for you to then be able to actually drill down and see exactly what's going on. Because you're then going to come up with another theory or you're going to come up with another hypothesis as to why certain things are behaving in the way that they are. So we can, we can go back to say, okay, well, things started dropping off around January the 9th. And we had 50 people that used, you know, wrote a story and then did this and then did that and then this happened. Well, let's drill down and actually see what was going on. So he, okay, well, at eight o'clock in the morning, he selected an achievement, then he did this, then he did this, he went to the store, then he did this and so on, and then he disappeared. So this is where things are start, possibly starting to break. And then you can go and find a few other people that you have some data for and say, well, how are they behaving? And you get some really detailed information about them. Say, so, ah, this is what's going on right now. Potentially, this is what's going on. And potentially, you could actually go back and speak to this person and say, hey, you know, this is, uh, can you tell me a little bit about, um, uh, you know, you used the store or you did this or whatever. You, you filled it for me on our blog, but it didn't work. I'm just looking for some information. Tell me what's going on. Would you mind me asking you a few questions or whatever? And you get some insight. But the biggest thing with this is that it, 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 it drills right down and gives you that particular insight and tells you, uh, 
breaks it down. It breaks it down for you, so it pinpoints where you need to be focusing your attention. Rather than you thinking to yourself, okay, well, we had so many people come to our website, it's not working right, we really need to, uh, we need to be going around rebranding our website, or we need to be doing this, or we need to be doing that, you know, it, it, it pinpoints where the problem is for you, so you can focus more on that. Yeah? And with that information, is that only if people can, because on our website, people just come in, they don't have to log in to actually be on it. So you need to rely on Facebook to really make use of this data or a, a social media site. Okay, so the, the, the question is that obviously you can't, you can't collect user-based information unless you've got a Facebook login or, or, or whatever. Yeah, it basically comes to, I mean, Facebook is, uh, is just a medium that we use. We can actually use Twitter or some social media, but you don't have to use that. Now, with apps, for example, apps actually ask you to, um, you know, apps will actually ask you to sign in. So it basically goes back to going to your developer and saying, is there a way that we can track user-based information? And so if the developer, com developer comes back to you and says, okay, well, for people that are filling the form in, obviously they're gonna leave their email address and then click the button. And if, is there a way that you can actually turn them into a user from that, then great, that could work for you. Or maybe if you've got them as a user on your email list, can you then turn them into user? But yeah, you have to be able to track that their, them as a user, you know, as a specific user ID. Then you can grab this data. And yeah, um, it is limited for you know websites where the people are just coming in. But if you think of a of, for, of an e-commerce website where you have to log in before you can buy the product, like Amazon, for example, then they are getting individual user-based information. So yeah, it doesn't work for everything. And again, it you know um, there are certain limitations. But if you can grab that data, then the more data that you can grab, then the more insight it's going to give you. So yeah, so yeah, so you know, and you might think to yourself, okay, well, if we're going to get everybody to log into our face, to log in via Facebook just to read out, just to read our blog, it's probably going to cause us a lot of problems, and you know, so you probably think, okay, well, we probably can't go down that route. It's probably not a good idea. But if it's a question, you're thinking to yourself, maybe we could try it. Then you could A/B test it. Why not? Yeah. And see what happens. And if you A/B test it and find that okay, everybody is happy to log in with Facebook, then great. You've just got yourself a lot more insight now. Mm -hmm. But if they're not, it's okay. Well, let's just go back to the drawing board and. And, uh, and continue as you are. But it's worth testing, yeah. and it's worth trying. And, and I think this is an obvious answer maybe, but if someone logs in for the first time to use the site, and then when they come back again, they just come straight in, the analytics will know that it's that person that's coming back every yes. time. And yes. that's because of cookies or something like that? Correct. Or so the question is, if, uh, if somebody leaves the website and comes back, two or three days later, yeah. the analytics will be able to work out there was the same person that came back. Yes. Um, with Google Analytics, they've kind of taken care of working those things out. And yeah, it, excuse me, it comes down to cookies and what have you. If it, with things like Track.io, it will come down to the work that you do yourself. And it probably will be cookies anyway. I mean, I'm, I'm not a developer or a coder, but yeah, that it, it will, the analytics will take care of that for you. Or yeah. rather the developer and the analytics, those two together, the developer will make sure that that's being covered. Yeah. So it does get covered for you, yes. Okay. And Google Analytics has things like uniques and that, so you can figure out who the unique visitors are rather than yes. just looking at overall summaries and all this kind of stuff, so yeah. So I'll show you Google Analytics now anyway. Content. So you can see landing pages. So you can see like my, um, in the last month or two, you can see like the, my most uh, popular blog post was the one with uh, my thoughts on emerging trends. But if I go further back, um, I do have ones that are, um, you know, I think there was, I had one that had like two or 3,000 visits in the space of like two hours or something. So I checked that the next day just to see how it was behaving. But you can, you can actually get that um, and see. Um, so this one, for example, if I take that much further back um, by, and do it by month. So I have to, I have to specify this one was, I think it was around September time. So let's do through till September till November, just as an example. But you can see, you can see I had a, I had a peak at the end of September when it got to about just under 3,000 visits. That was because it, uh, it basically got picked up on Reddit, so it went a little bit crazy, and then it got picked up by another uh, business journal and what have you, and it went pretty silly. Um, and, but you can see that you can see that which blog post it was. It was this one: Why the teenager next door has more sales. So I know that that's the kind of content that does well with people, and you can see how many new visits there were, and then I can see what the traffic source on that was. So you know, so I know that okay, on September the 29th, I had 
you know, 2,700 2, visits, and what I can do is I can go back to traffic sources, and then I can go back and say, I asked a question in terms of, um, this is, uh, I keep changing, let's have a look at all traffic numbers, go to channels. So you can see all the channels, so you can see where most of the traffic's come from. So I can go back and say, that I want it for this particular date, so I can say month, and then if I want to drill down further, but you can see that, okay, this month I had this many visits, and then if I want to, you know, I can see where most of those actually came from and start drilling down. But this is what I'm saying about Google Analytics. It gets, it, it gets quite annoying to actually figure out, okay, well, where is most... You know, to actually start asking those questions, you have to really start getting in and figuring out where it's all coming from. And that's, that's why I'm saying Google Analytics can be quite annoying because if, you, if, if I want to just figure out right now, this is, this is what I want to know, where did most of my traffic come on on September the 29th? Yeah, I can get to the answer, but because it's so overwhelming with information, I either have to set up a custom report or I have to start drilling down a lot and try and find out those pieces of information. Sorry, I'm just looking, um, while you're doing yours, yeah. I'm just looking at our own, I'm just okay. going to our own website. Today. Have you had much traffic? It's so interesting. Well, just being able to look at where people come in through, and I mean, it doesn't surprise me what it's telling me. So, 541 visitors come directly from Google, so yeah. by Googling, but, and I reckon that's purely because putting in like pop-up space yeah. yeah exactly exactly which means you're not taking advantage of that traffic right. people are typing in if people are if you've got 500 is that in over a month um so oh, I don't know how to get yeah so from yeah so it's a month so from december 22nd to okay 25th. so it's roughly 10 to 20 people a day yeah okay so you're getting 10 to 20 people a day that are actually typing something in yeah. so you'll be i mean you're built to do keyword analysis so you built a good keyword and you built to do organic for example and you'll get some keyword analysis as to what people are actually typing in Where right you go to so if you go to acquisition and then go to keywords and then go to organic uh am i looking at the right sorry i might not be looking yeah so go okay, under acquisition keywords yeah go organic ahead. Okay, so you build, you should have a, a keyword that's doing quite well, which is creating, or a few keywords that are getting most of your traffic at the moment. Not provided. So okay. the first one, yeah, the first one's not provided. Yeah. Um, it's like 70% of Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, there is supposed, there's supposed to be a way you can actually figure out what that particular keyword is, but I'm not sure what that is. There is a link there, so maybe if I click on the link, it might No, it doesn't say. But the but the second one is meanwhile space. So oh, okay. So, so if this means people already know who they're actually looking for yeah. at that point. So what you but the thing is this is okay. So you've actually uh, a grant twenty nine. So four hundred and sixty six people type something in not provided, and then twenty nine people, which is the second one down, is meanwhile space. Okay. So you know that okay, four hundred odd people in a month, the ten to twenty people a day are actually yeah. coming to your website using a keyword of some sort and then your website's actually not bringing them into your shop or into your cafe yeah. so if your conversion rate was that okay if 10 people are, like we don't know what the keyword is but if 10 if you know that the 10 people were saying co-working space or startup cafe and they've come to your website and never come back does that mean and you knew that okay at least one of those people you could grab that means that you're actually you've got 400 people a month that you're not capitalizing on right now that you could be doing something with yeah so already that's good. the analytics has given you an answer that you've got some potential interest there that you're not capitalizing on. Yeah. So the next thing would be to do what? Which is, okay, well, how can we actually get, figure out what these keywords are? Let's go back to our website developer or let's go back to the expert and say, can you figure out what these keywords are? And then let's, see, let's track what these keywords are. And if that keyword happens to be co-working space and people are coming to, your, to our website and people are not actually coming into the cafe, what is it that the website's not doing that we could actually change and start getting those people coming in? It's interesting because it, on the average time they spend on the site, so averagely they're looking at th three to four uh, pages and they're staying on the website for almost three minutes. Which averaging, is brilliant. Which is, yeah, that seems really good to me. Which means that the website's not, so the, so the thing is that they're spending, your, what you're finding as an overall summary right. is that of people spending three to four minutes on your website, yeah. they're going through three to four pages at a time and then they're not coming back, right? Or you don't know what's happening after that. Now, if you did event tracking at this point, so you could then drill down, okay, one individual person, what is he actually doing? What pages on the website is he actually yeah. looking at? and then set your funnels up. Yeah. So, you, so you've already got 400 people coming in a month. 
So you could say, well, you know, let, we, re we could really do with a conversion rate right now, because uh, right now, if you had a conversion rate of 10% over the month, that means that that's an extra 50 people come into your cafe in a month. Mm -hmm. Is that a good metric for you? So, so you could set that up as an objective. You could say, well, we want 10% of the people that are looking for us to come to our website. So that's another, we want to aim to get another 50 people coming into the, the, to this cafe. So, okay, you know, into the startup cafe. So you say, okay, let's set the funnels up. Let's do the event tracking and let's see out of 500 people, how many, and let's set up a meaningful action. So let's get them to either call us or fill the form in, or something else. Well, what's the meaningful action? Let's get them to call us. So you put a call us button up on your website, right? Yeah. So now if we can get that to 10%, you can measure the funnel and you can see, okay, after two after because you know that after a month you're gonna get 500 uh, uh, visitors, but because we know this thing about statistical confidence, you could even do it with 100. So you know on 100 people, you need five people to actually be calling you because you've decided that's your uh, activation or that's your conversion. And, and that, because you're aiming for 10% in terms of your conversions, you could say, right, let's set the event tracking up and let's set up this meaningful action of this button. So you could say, right, after a week, if a, out of 100 people, if we get five people to actually call us, we've achieved our conversion rate. That's a good progress. Mm -hmm. But if after a week, we're still not getting five people to call us, okay, well, what else can we try? What else is going wrong? And then you can try something. You can say, okay, well, let's change the callers button because you might have had a theory. Well, either the callers button is going to work or the form is going to work. So, okay, well, let's, let's get rid of the... So you tried the form for in the beginning. So, okay, well, let's forget rid of the form. Let's try the callers button. So you set up a callers button the next week and you say, okay, well, we ha we've now got another... Because you know you're getting 500 people a month consistently. So you know that that, that traffic's already coming in. So you say next week, okay, well, let's try a callers button. And do we get five people calling us? And suddenly you get five people calling you and you speak to them and you say, oh yes, we have this lovely space. People, we can come and stay because you know you people, you know that when people actually come into the cafe, they do actually stay yeah. and they start converting and they actually start coming to the cafe and they start using the co-working space. And you think, ah, right. Now we know that five people every single week are gonna actually come and actually use the cafe. Mm -hmm. That's 25 people every single month that are actually gonna come and use this. And you think, ah, we know we've got a 5% conversion. We know we can get 25 more people in every single month. So you can go back to whoever's funding the project and say, well, if we can, we know that we've got a 5% conversion rate. So if we could get another thousand people to our website, we know from that we could get another uh, 50 people in to actually into the cafe. Yeah. We know that because we can prove this with the analytics. This is proving this is actually working. Yeah. So you can go back to them and get that funding and actually pay for that development. Or you can be confident to actually go out and pay for the advertising. Or the alternative is, okay, we've got it up to 25, right? And um, so, but those 25 came, they stayed, they used it once or twice, but they never came back. Okay, what, what can we, because you need to be measured the analytics on that. Now they're spending time in the cafe, so you, you can't really do the analytics on the website anymore. Yeah. You need to be doing analytics in person. So yeah. c can you use a tool? Maybe there's a tool out there where you can track how many people come in Right, maybe there's an app that can track how many people come in and how long they stay. Mm -hmm. The chances are in 2014, there probably is an app that can do that for you. Yeah. The chances of that are not that slim anymore, but if there isn't, maybe you can just do some tallies on, on, a, on an Excel spreadsheet or whatever, run some analytics of your own, right? And see, oh, oh you can develop a really small app and say every time, like because every time somebody comes in, they have to use your wireless, right? Yeah. So if you had a little app that every time they use the wireless, that you then track their user behavior. So yeah, you can actually get these, in fact, you can actually get these pieces of software like, um, you know, this cloud Wi-Fi and all this kind of yeah. stuff. So you actually get then get their username and everything. So every time they actually come in and you've then got their username. So you then, you've got the analytics that, okay, we had 25 people that every single month they came, uh, 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 you know, we got the callers button working and they actually came. And then the next thing that you can now do is, okay, well, out of those people, well, Cam came and stayed, but um, Jessica left, right? Or 25 people stayed, out of the 25 people, only five people stay every single month. Yeah. So you know, okay, well, we need, really need to be solving the retention problem. Okay, we've, we've improved the ac activation problem a little bit. We know we, can we know we can improve that further. We know how we can increase that um, level of activation. What we now have is a retention problem. 
okay, well, let's speak to our individual users. Let's go and speak to them. Let's figure out what is it that's actually causing them not to stay. Oh, well, I'm not staying because it's too cold or I'm not staying because of this or whatever. Okay, let's again do our A-B testing. Let's do some more retention. Let's do the analytics and say, okay, well, we have a theory. The theory is, is because the place is not warm enough, that's why they're not staying. Okay, for just for a week, because we know we've got 25 people every single month, just for a week, let's just put the heating up and warm the place up. Let's go back to these 25 people that said they would stay, but they're not staying because it's cold. Let's, we've got their usernames, we've got their activity, we've got their behavior. Let's go back to them and say, okay, we've warmed the place up now. Are you gonna come back? And if they, because don't forget, you know, people, um, people say one thing, but actually we, we, that's just humans. That's what we do. We warm the place up for a week or a month because you've got, you've got your analytics that are showing you what your retention levels are. So if your retention levels are saying you should measure this over a month, you then go back to those people, bring them back in for a month, see if they stay for a month now. And if they do, you say, ah, the place is warmer. These people are staying. This is working. Right, now we have the confidence that we can actually get 25 more people in, or we can spend money on advertising. So we can, in fact, we can actually just go and advertise on Facebook, or we can, we can just go and do a little bit of SEO or, or whatever. We can make a few tweaks. We can get these people in. We can actually afford to actually spend more on the heating bill because these people are gonna spend 10 pound or 20 pound or 30 pound or whatever, or we're gonna get more funding because we can prove more people are gonna stay. And these people actually start coming in and this actually starts working for you. You say, right, well, let's just increase this activity now. Let's just get more people in. Yeah. Like, let's activate more people. And then you can just keep tweaking all these little things. You can improve the, you can tweak the retention, you can tweak the acquisition, you can tweak all these little things. And before you know it, because you've got that compounding effect, now from the 500 people that were coming in in a month, instead of one person calling you and actually coming in and using the cafe, You've improved the activation, you've improved the retention, and as you've been tweaking it, out of those 500 people, now you're getting 100 people that are coming in every single month, right? And you've got 100 people, and out of those 100 people, you've got 50 people that want to use the cafe, that want to stay every single day. And now you've got so many people, you're so busy, you're like, ah, we've actually got more than we can actually handle. And that, that happened just from the 500 people that were Googling you every single month. You didn't even have to spend any money on advertising or anything. But it's just capturing them. It's just activating them. And this is the biggest thing with marketing is that the, this is the biggest thing in terms of like what, you know, what I do in terms of the consulting is that all the so-called digital marketers and the people that do the internet marketing, the digital marketing and the advertising and all those kind of things. The thing with that is that, you know, with the, with the marketing is that they spend all their efforts just on acquisition just on grabbing customers or just on shouting as loudly as possible. So they go out there and they say, well, can we pay somebody to do search engine optimization for us? Can we pay somebody to do uh, Google advertising for us? Can we, you know, can, we, can we spend a lot of money on Google ads? Can we spend a lot of money on Facebook? Can we distribute leaflets? Can we do events? Can we do this? Can we do that? And what you really need to be doing is focusing on improving your conversion funnel. Because once that thing is improved and you know it's working for you, then you've got the confidence and you know you can actually go and spend the money on, on whatever, on distributing leaflets or, or, or whatever. But you've got, you've clearly got people that have an interest in your product right now is you're not activating them. Yeah. That's what's going on right now. That's really interesting. It is very interesting. <laughs> okay, so any other questions? Because um, no, I haven't I been through so. the rest of the things, but yeah. Not about I mean, I'm happy to answer. I'll switch this video off now.